How you doing, guys? Dr. Thompson here with Exemplify Health Center, your wellness way affiliate right here in Yorkville, Illinois. Happy Monday. I hope you guys had a great uh, Christmas. <clears throat> I did. Uh, actually, our office is off all of this week, so I have the ability to be able to rest and recover and be able to rejuvenate. It's been a pretty long uh, last couple of months, <laughs> so I'm going to be enjoying the break. Uh, obviously. So good evening to everyone. This is going to be our last live of the year. Boy, I can't believe 2021 is done. Heading into 2022. Uh, so no topic for today, but I wanted to do a question and answer. And we had some awesome people uh, uh, submit some great questions. And so uh, I will be here for probably in the next half hour or so, and we'll go through some of these questions. And if we have any time at the end, uh, we'll see if we can answer those questions as well, because I can see uh, some of the comments on here. So if you do have a question along the way, please type that in and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time uh, to be able to address that. A lot of questions regarding uh, COVID <laughs> and uh, you know things like that. So uh, some of the things you'll see in the topic uh, uh, of this uh, video uh, is what we're going to talk about. And people um, put, uh, they submitted some really awesome questions. And I know that uh, if this is impacting one person, I know that it's impacting a lot of people who uh, watch our uh, live videos every single week. So let's go ahead, guys, and let's get right into it. I know at six o'clock, I am going to be uh, taping a podcast uh, for someone. So I got to make sure that I'm also ready for that. All right. All right. One of the first questions I want to go over uh, with you is... Um, uh, someone had asked the question that they had uh, COVID in mid-October, so about two months ago, and they're still dealing with the ears being clogged, uh, even with weekly adjustments, uh, hands feel swollen at times, uh, muscle pain in the upper back, arms. Uh, she's used nettle leaf and albiza to try to help with some of the ears, but nothing is working. Uh, so would love some guidance, okay? Doctor told me to take uh, Zyrtec and Flonase. <laughs> All right, so clogged ears, um, I know that uh, this happens with kids quite a bit, um, and it, uh, it can happen in adults too, especially if they uh, have some kind of double ear infection. Guys, the biggest thing when it comes to the ears, and, and if the ears are clogged, the first thing I'm always going to uh, look at is why aren't they draining correctly? So um, just remember the inner ear connects to uh, in the throat through the eustachian tube. That's how the ears uh, will actually drain. And if those eusta uh, eustachian tubes close up and they won't open up, uh, usually due to muscle spasm, um, then what happens is those ears aren't able to drain, they'll fill up with fluid. So you always want to consider, uh, is there a problem with the eustachian tube? This is actually, guys, where chiropractic adjustments come in unbelievably um, because uh, what they'll do is actually relax the muscles along the spine and allow the eustachian tubes to be able to open up. I know that my kids... Uh, yes, they did have an ear infection occasionally, but the longest they ever had an ear infection and a clogged ear was about four to five hours. That was it. Um, but if you've had some kind of illness and they're not draining, the first thing that I would say is, is check your x-ray and see if you need to do something more. So, you know, again, a lot of it can be the skill of the actual chiropractor adjusting. Um, but the other thing is too, is check your food allergies or anything that's going to be causing an increase in mucus secretion. Yes, that's going to be inside the ears as well. Um, or you may have some kind of, um, just remember, if you have a lot of mucus, the ears can't clear out. Uh, then you're going to tend to get a lot of bacteria that will start to um, start to grow in there because again, bacteria love a dark, moist, mucousy place. Uh, one thing that can be good for the ears is going on a dose of oregano. Uh, oregano will do great for um, the ears, uh, but I wouldn't really take it longer than about four to six weeks. Um, and do not put oregano in your ears or you'll burn. You got to take it orally. All right. <laughs> um, but when you're having some of the muscle pain and things like that afterwards, uh, one of the things that I would just check is to see like, how's that immune system recovering? Um, because just remember when you're getting things like body aches and things like that, it just means that you're just in still in an inflamed state, <clears throat> which is why when you get sick, it's why you're body hurts, you know, all the time. Inflammation is going up in order to be able to handle some kind of infection. That's a great, great question. All right, next one. Hopefully I can get all of these in here. I have, uh, Sarah had said, I have Hashimoto's uh, uh, thyroiditis, uh, so hypothyroidism, that's autoimmune, 
Um, and she feels worse after taking Synthroid 100 micrograms. Uh, I also take everyday vitamins of kelp, B12, D3, zinc, turmeric. What else can I do to help me feel better, less tired, helping with weight loss, feeling irritable, uh, things like that. So uh, this is where, guys, testing comes in, all right? This is really work, especially when it comes to thyroid. Uh, testing is so important. And most of the people think that they've gotten a full thyroid test. And I have never seen um, MDs, not even natural paths, that have really looked into the thyroid on how we look at the thyroid when we're testing it. We're looking at 18 different markers, not just one, two, or three. We're looking at a whole bunch of them. So, you know, this question probably needs a little bit more context and a lot of time actually going over it, but I can give you some general guidelines. The first thing that I would say is, Sarah, is just make sure that you have been properly tested because a lot of women do when they go on Synthroid, they don't feel any better. In fact, they can feel worse. And one of the reasons why is, is because, um, Number one, have you gotten your cortisol levels checked because taking Synthroid is contraindicated or means don't take it if um, you have uh, any kind of issues with adrenal insufficiency, okay? So it can make you feel much, much worse. Uh, but the other thing is people think that their energy is just going to bounce back if they go on Synthroid, which is basically synthetic T4. Um, and if you haven't been tested properly, you might have a problem with your conversion of it. So um, it's actually converted at the cellular level from T4 into the active form of T3, which is what your body uses. And most of it will get converted in the liver, in the gastrointestinal system, where most of it's getting converted, uh, which is why if you said, I'm having some problems with weight loss issues and things like that, problem might be actually in the liver and you're having a problem with converting it. So uh, one of the things that you might be seeing is you might be seeing really high levels of T4, really low levels of T3. You're going to feel tired, you're going to feel lethargic, you're going to feel fatigued. And then you also may see if they're testing it properly, really high levels of reverse T3, uh, which is basically the breaks on the thyroid and you might be even slowing it down even more. So a lot of the supplements that I see that you're taking with kelp, B12, D3, zinc, turmeric, uh, things like that, it, what it really looks like is it just looks like that you're trying to feed the thyroid, okay? Um, which is okay, but the the, the idea with, um, especially with uh, Hashimoto's, is remember it's an autoimmune so really what you need to address is is by dumping more things if it truly is Hashimoto's dumping more things to try to feed the thyroid when there has been possible the possibility of thyroid dis, uh, destruction is really what you really need to handle it is you need to handle it from an immune system perspective so um, this is why actually handling the immune system will be a lot more beneficial than trying to dump a bunch of uh, supplements to try to feed the thyroid with you know things like iodine and zinc and things like that okay all right uh christy said any advice on dealing with parasites uh interesting are there any ways to test for them other than stool testing and can a random stool sample miss them, okay? Um, I will say, Christy, the best way to test for par parasites is in fact doing a stool. But, you know, again, I've had people come in and they've gone to their MD, <clears throat> excuse me, and they they have a uh, stool test. Um, but basically what they're just looking at is they're just looking for some kind of infection. Um, I know that when we're looking for a, uh, looking for, uh, a parasite specifically, uh, we will do a three-day stool sample from Genova Diagnostics, and we we don't do it in just one day. We do it in three days, uh, and the reason why is is because um, a lot of times you can't get a parasite on one pass, which is why you're going to have a lot better chance of doing it when you're collecting stool over three days. Now, if I ever suspect there might be a parasite uh, that's going on, uh, I'll actually ask the patient too that, hey, go ahead and let's do this uh, stool sample. We're going to do it for three days. Um, but then uh, we, we actually have them take it around the full moon. <laughs> so I know it sounds crazy, um, but it seems that uh, parasites typically will pick up in their activity around a full moon cycle, which is why people always say crazy things happen uh, during the full moon. And then that will give us its best chance of seeing if there is in fact a parasite there. Um, although I will say this guys is as far as uh, a parasite, 
I don't see it as often as what a lot of other natural health doctors say that it's there. Um, I just don't see it as often. We've done a lot of stool tests and I have seen a parasite uh, literally in the last three years, about four times. Okay. And I want to give you also a different perspective regarding parasites because what we think is we need to do some things in order to kill it off. And yes, initially you might have to do some things to help facilitate the body to be able to kill it off. There's things like wormwood and, um, you know, oregano can do it. Just, you know, um, different berberines um, can definitely uh, uh, help with that. But the biggest thing when it comes to a parasite is that you're a lot more susceptible to a parasite if in fact you have very low stomach acid. Let me say that again. If you have really, really low stomach acid, you're gonna be a lot more susceptible to a parasite uh, because just remember, things like yeast, uh, bacterial overgrowths, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowths, parasites and things like that, what keeps those in check is actually having healthy stomach acid production. Guys, and this always comes back to how we're looking at things in a wellness way approach from a different perspective is like when you are under stress, eating on the go, being stressed out, spinal issues, anything that just puts you into a perpetual state of fight and flight, fight or flight is going to lower stomach acid. And yes, eventually it will lead to reflux. Yes, it will lead to ulcers, um, but it can also lead to uh, parasites and things like that because those things aren't going to be killed off in the stomach. And that's the number one reason why we have a stomach that secretes stomach acid is to actually sterilize the food. I mean, I want you to think about it. Two people go to the same restaurant, they have the same meals. One gets food poisoning and the other one doesn't. They ate the same food, yet one got sick because their stomach didn't have enough stomach acid in order to properly sterilize the food. One of the things that we do with almost everyone is we start giving them high doses of stomach acid, uh, betaine hydrochloric acid, um, just to start getting their stomach acid levels up and they'll immediately start feeling better because they start breaking down their food the way that it's supposed to. Uh, but that's a great question, especially for anyone who uh, needs a little bit of insight when it comes to parasites as well. Okay. Um, let's see here. Dr. Thompson, does the wellness way have a COVID protocol for, uh, early onset or restoration after if you, uh, if so, can you share those recommendations? Okay. Um, so here, this is the, the word that I, I hate the most <laughs> and I appreciate you bringing it up <clears throat> is, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole idea of a protocol. Okay. This, guys, this is why, you know, the whole idea is that we don't guess, we test, because if we have a recent um, immune system panel, there are just certain things that everybody says that you need to take, that this is my protocol, that you don't even necessarily need. Um, so when everyone says you need to be on vitamin D, vitamin C, zinc, quercetin, um, you know, all of these different things. It's just kind of like saying, we're just going to throw the kitchen sink at everything and, you know, hopefully it works. Okay. So I will give you some generalizations <laughs> regarding this. Um, a lot of it can be dependent. I just want to think about, you know, initially, uh, one of the things that can actually help prevent um, the virus from uh, attaching to ACE receptors in the lung is actually nettle leaf. Um, Pre, uh, then during, I mean, if you're initially uh, having an infection uh, in the first couple stages, you want to support the innate immune system. Uh, this is why things like, yes, vitamin C, yes, vitamin D, um, you know, can, or vitamin C and zinc uh, can help. Uh, but there's other things like elderberry, which is going to be high in vitamin C. Uh, echinacea can also help this as well because they help to support natural killer cells, which are really just part of your um innate immune system. And then you have your adaptive immune system. So this is tend, you know, tend to go into people who are a little bit like uh, long haulers or who are having a problem after five, six, seven days. Um, and I've done a video on it. Things like licorice can actually help with viral uh, replication. Uh, wormwood can actually help uh, increase your CD8 cells, or which are responsible for uh, killing off viral cells. So I want you to think about it. Um, and then obviously being in the least amount of stre uh, stress as possible, which is why a lot of times we'll adjust people a lot, why they're sick, because it helps them. It helps to keep stressors off the body as much as possible. Um, this is why 
uh, we have adjusted people before and they've gone home and their immune system just ramped up tremendously. And they're like, as soon as I got adjusted and we started connecting neurolo uh, neurologically to the immune system, um, they're like, it feels like my immune system just absolutely ramped up. Um, and which is why you'll feel worse and then it'll come back down because the harder your immune system is working, the worse you'll actually feel. Um, but just think, if you're trying to inhibit the replication of a virus, then doing things like licorice can help. And then also wormwood, increasing those CD8 cells, vitamin D, um, and um, there's some other ones. But a lot of times we will try not to give people things. Uh, and specifically, we'll try to work on their immune system prior to them having some kind of emergency. Remember, what we're trying to do is we're trying to prevent fires, um, not try to go and fix fires all the time. That's really the job of uh, medical doctors, okay? Awesome question. Uh, here's another one. Can you get COVID more than once? A well-respected non-narrative doctor said it was one and done. And yet it is, um, I've known people who have said they got it more than once. That is a great question. Um, I will say this, okay? I will say this. Um, it's going to depend on um, a couple of things. Um, number one, can you get COVID more than once? Well, if you, ha you have gotten a natural infection and you have natural immunity to it, um, then yes, you're going to have it just once. And the reason why is this is because um, when you have a natural infection, you're going to build an antibody response to the whole virus. Um, so, and a proper immune response demands the whole virus, not a piece of it. Um, so number one, uh, if people who are getting <clears throat> these vaccines and they are getting just basically a piece of it, which is the spike protein, then they're going to have a very specific immune response to that spike protein. And all it takes is a couple of mutations and the immune system says, whoops, we don't have an antibody a response to this anymore which is why, in my opinion, the whole reason why this is keep going is actually because of the vaccinated. Um, they, they have, um, all it takes is Delta, Omicron, whatever. So as, as the more different mutations, they don't have any kind of anti antibody response to it. So this is why guys, natural immunity is always best. We've said it for the last almost two years now is say, if you're worried about a virus, start strengthening your body to withstand any virus, start strengthening your immune system and quit living in fear. So there are people who have done a doggone thing when it comes to their health, uh, other than just mask up, but they keep eating the same crappy food. They never ever go to the gym. They never work on anything except just living in fear and watching the news. So um, that's why you have to build up your internal environment and quit relying um, on things from the outside in to try to get you better. So if someone has the vaccine, can they get it again? In my opinion, yes, they can because they have a, a very specific antibody response if in fact they even can make an antibody response because we've tested people who have a zero antibody response after having two doses. And a lot of it has to do with their bone marrow and where these cells, uh, where the plasma cells and B lymphocytes that are making antibodies, where they're actually living. Just remember, after you have an infection, you're going to have memory T cells that are going to be living at the area of the initial infection, even if you have a negative COVID antibody test. Um, for example, for me, I had positive antibodies, uh, but I had a very low detectable amount only because of antibodies, only because it had been about two years since I had been sick. And so I will still have some of those memory T cells that are going to be hanging out in the lungs and it will be able to attack even if there is another variant because I've had exposure to the whole virus and not just to a part of it. Now, the other thing, can you get COVID more than once? Um, and I would say on this aspect, yes, uh, because I believe that the, the testing is completely faulty. Okay. Um, you get above what, 35 uh, cycle thresholds and you, you are not, um, you are not testing for an infection anymore. Uh, you're testing for viral remnants. And in fact, even if you did have a viral infection, um, those viral remnants can still be persistent 
uh, even in a nasal cavity for two to three months afterwards. So these people that are saying I tested, you know, positive and three months later, I tested positive again. Some of it has to do with just the fact that I don't trust the testing at all. And I think the testing is driving the narrative. And guys, remember, most of the people that are doing the testing are getting tested for the ones who are vaccinated. <laughs> so, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I think if you had a normal natural infection, then no, you're not going to get it again, especially uh, right away. Okay. All right. Uh, Cheryl asked the question, what are some beneficial exercises to start if you have not been working out in a lot of in a, many months, uh, other than just walking, okay, that's the first one. So here it is, January first. A lot of people are going to want to start an exercise program. They might not have done a whole lot. Um, beneficial exercises, I would say, guys, is that one of the things, especially this is true for women, is you really want to avoid having this long cortisol response for anything longer than 15 to 20 minutes repeatedly over and over and over again. And what that looks like is that looks like going and doing, um, we will call like monostructural type movements. So just stair climbing, jogging, doing biking, um, you know, just doing the one thing over and over in attempt to just burn so many uh, different calories. Because just remember for a woman, what you're going to do is if you constantly are elevating your cortisol and you're, you're dealing with things like inflammation and mental stress and spinal stressors and things like that, you're not going to have a whole heck of a lot of cortisol left in the tank to be able to, uh, to be able to help you with your exercise. And in fact, it's just going to start stealing it from pregnenolone, which is going to lower your progesterone levels. And then you're going to have all kinds of issues with your menstrual cycle. So if you haven't, and you're seeing that, Hey, my energy is starting to pick up because we've handled those stressors and inflammation, things like that. I would say that one of the best thing is to do very short, very intense exercise and to only do really exercises that are functional. So don't really do things that are going to, um, you know, that you just don't use in everyday life. So I would say squats would be great. You got to just be careful because if you haven't squatted in a year and you do a hundred air squats, you are going to be very, very sore for the next probably 10, 10 days to two weeks. Um, but things like squatting, things like deadlifting, um, things like burpees, uh, you know, jumping rope, um, and then just doing it in, you know, I like to start off people with doing interval type training in which you're doing something maybe in like three to three minute sets and then rest for two to three minutes and then do four, you know, three to four sets of doing that. Uh, but if you haven't worked out in a while, you just got to take it slow, take it easy, and then listen to your body's feedback as far as what you're able to tolerate, especially when it comes to muscle soreness. Uh, and then any suggestions on post-COVID to help with shortness or a breath or a winded feeling? Um, yes, there's been people. Uh, I know that I had uh, kind of a winded feeling and it was for about probably about four weeks. Or I just didn't have, you know, my total wind. And um, uh, but I would say make sure that you're still not dealing with the virus. OK, so there's, you know, what you would call. Uh, long haulers are not dealing with some kind of secondary viral infection, but there's things that can help with the lungs. Actually, licorice can help a lot with the lungs. Make sure that you're getting enough zinc. Make sure you're getting enough potassium too. Uh, you can literally be deficient in a lot of different things and it can cause um, quite a bit of a, that, that winded feeling. But the other thing is too, is that if you haven't really uh, elevated your heart rate and really started breathing heavy, it's always going to feel kind of... Um, awkward and it's going to feel a lot different. And so, uh, I would say, you know, give it a try doing that, but, um, you know, make sure that you got, are getting enough zinc, make sure you're getting enough, uh, potassium, uh, and then make sure you're also, you know, uh, if you're still dealing with it, still need to clear the lungs out, you know, a little bit if you're dealing with congestion and things, um, licorice can actually help with that quite a bit. All right. All right. So it's about 543. And let's see if we have any other questions on here, because I think I went through just about all of them that people have submitted. All right. Let me say hi to a couple of people. Sherry, how are you doing? Heather, nice to see you. Diane, it's good to see you. Mackenzie, how are you doing? I hope you're enjoying Florida. Shay, uh, Alberta, Canada. Holy cow. That is, uh, and I, I pray for Canada. There's just too many weird things that are going on. Um, uh, Southern Canada, uh, Oklahoma. 
Uh, Susan Meyer, how are you doing? Deanne, how are you doing? Uh, what, let me ask, answer your questions, um, Deanne. Uh, let me see if I can actually bring this up. What would be some reasons vitamin D is staying on the low side? Can't seem to increase even with uh, taking 15,000 to 20,000 IUs daily. Uh, Diane, I actually just uh, dealt with this in an individual. Um, just remember uh, what you take uh, as um, uh, oral vitamin D is not what is measured in the blood and it has to be converted uh, in the liver, okay? Um, so <clears throat> you could have an issue with liver conversion. So then I would usually wanna look at liver markers. The other thing is too, is this is a fat soluble by, uh, vitamin. Um, or actually I should say a hormone, but you, you need, um, gallbladder. Okay. Uh, in order to be able to, uh, absorb the vitamin D, which is why if people don't have a gallbladder, which is why they tend to be very low in vitamin D. Uh, the other thing that I would do too, is, is make sure that you are, when you're taking your vitamin D, make sure that you are taking it, um, either with some bile, if you don't have a gallbladder, or but make sure that you're taking it with some fat in order to stimulate a little bit of gallbladder uh, production to help with the absorption of vitamin D. So it's usually if you're taking a lot of it, it's an absorption issue, uh, or it can also be a liver issue because um, it, again, if you're having a, pro a hard time converting it at the level of the liver, then chances are there's probably other issues that are going on that involve the liver with hormones, thyroid function, um, weight loss and things like that. So that's a great question, okay? Um, let's see here, uh, Cynthia, uh, watching from British Columbia, Canada. How you doing? Janet, good evening uh, to you. Um, let me show this one. Heart damage, uh, a relative uh, has to get on a treadmill or, or get moving rapidly when she loses feeling in her arms and legs, blood pressure drops. Have you ever heard of this sort of thing? And if she has heart damage, uh, will she be expected to have to do this indefinitely? Uh, question has to get on a treadmill or move around when she loses feeling in her arms and legs. Oh, okay. That's an interesting thing that is going on. If this is due to low blood pressure, um, I would say if you are losing feeling in the arms and legs and, it's, and there is low blood pressure, um, there's probably an issue with the adrenal glands, uh, uh, because that is, that is what is, can help to increase blood pressure when it's needed. Um, the other thing is too, though, is, uh, um, when it, when you're losing, especially like in the arms, it may be something, uh, positional. So there's something that's called thoracic outlet syndrome. You want to look into that. Um, certain positions can actually pinch off the arteries are going into the hands. Um, which has to do a lot with the position of the shoulders, the position of the uh, collarbone, the position of the neck. Um, but then, you know, the other thing is too, is there's so, like I said, there's a, could be a lot of things, but if it's due to low blood pressure, uh, check the medications that they might be on because there are certain medications that can block the adrenal glands with the intention of lowering blood pressure. Um, and a lot of times it can cause uh, more harm than good. So uh, that's a great question. All right. Let's see if we got any more. Um, all right. Jana, hi from Denmark. Wow, that's awesome. Oh, Melbourne, Australia. Good day, mate. <laughs> um, yes. Um, Deanne, what I would do, uh, because I know that you had just said that, I do take it back with MCT oil. Um, what I would do is... is uh, actually MCT oil will not stimulate gallbladder production just as an FYI. So, uh, which is why if people don't have a gallbladder. They can take MCT oil and not, uh, have loose stool and things like that. So I would be making sure that you're taking it with, you know, uh, the vitamin D with the biggest and with the fattiest meal of the day. Okay. Um, so, or you may, if you do have a sluggish gallbladder, you know, again, guys, if you have a, if you have an issue with the gallbladder, you have an issue with the liver. If you have a, an, an issue with vitamin D conversion, you have an issue with the liver. If you have an issue with estrogen dominance, you have an issue with the liver. If you have an issue with your menstrual cycle, a lot of times you have an issue with the liver. So there's so many things that are involved, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the liver. All right. All right. I'm going to take one more for you guys. Uh, Shay has a great question. What are your thoughts on colloidal silver? All right. Um, colloidal silver. 
I have given people colloidal silver. Um, and in fact, I don't have any problems with taking colloidal silver, especially if you are dealing with um, an acute infection. So I'm actually glad you brought that up because a lot of times I just forget about it. Um, colloidal silver is kind of like a natural fire department type approach. So I'm not a fan of just taking it just to take it every single day. Um, but basically the whole idea behind colloidal silver is that it just uh, basically donates an ion and it causes disruption of a viral or bacterial membrane, uh, which then disrupts it and it helps to kill it off, but ultimately you still need the immune system to go and clean that up. So it kind of works like um, an, an antibiotic without having, without completely destroying your microbiome in the process. Um, so um, if someone is acute, yeah, we'll give them some colloidal silver. Um, actually, where I've used it probably the most um, is when people are having issues with mold, um, and especially when they're living in a mold situation and they don't, they haven't had the opportunity to do any kind of mold remediation. Uh, we'll actually use a nasal spray in order to help. Uh, try to kill off uh, fungus and mold and things like that that can actually grow within the, the the sinus cavities because again it's a dark and moist place that's you know that's exactly where mold actually likes to live so I do use uh, colloidal silver um, probably I've probably only recommended it maybe 10 to 15 times this year uh, but I actually do have it on uh, handy at home and uh, for my hand uh, for uh, my family and so uh, occasionally i will take it especially if i feel like something is going to be uh, something's coming on or i start to feel a little bit run down so great question guys all right all right so guys 550 i gotta get ready to do a podcast with an individual uh so last uh live of the year so i hope guys uh i will not be on probably may i maybe next week uh but if not definitely the week after so if you have any interesting topics that you want me to go over uh just go ahead and just drop it in the comments uh, guys i always promise you i read every comment but i can't always respond to everyone so i apologize but we always appreciate the engagement we always appreciate um all of the shares that you guys have done during this year, uh, we appreciate everything. And, and you guys are, are really sincerely, you're, from the bottom of my heart, you guys are really awesome. Um, and um, I hope you enjoyed this, the questionnaire uh, and answer and got something from it. So I'd always appreciate uh, your engagement. I always appreciate your likes. I always appreciate your shares. And uh, let's make 2022 even better than 2021. So guys, get your New Year's resolutions ready. I hope you guys are ready for it. In fact, I hope you actually already started it because if you know what they are, why not start today? So guys, I will see you uh, probably next week or the week after. Have a great, great New Year's. Have a great evening. And we will talk to you guys very soon. Be well.